Our third speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Shira Leah Brown, who also has MDDS. Um, she's a neuroscientist from the University of Western Sydney, and she'd like to talk to us about her re current research. Thank you, Shira Leah. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Shira Lee. Um, so today uh, I'd like to talk about uh, my MDDS journey, but also the research that I've started doing um, at the beginning of this year. So uh, I've had MDDS uh, for about three and a half years. Um, it was on a short boat ride from the mainland of uh, Queensland over to the Great Barrier Reef. It was really rocky. Um, the boat was all over the place. I vomited a lot and cried. <laughs> um, and so after the, the boat ride, uh, so I arrived on the island and, you know, I felt rubbish but I didn't think anything of it and I thought that it would subside. Uh, so after that uh, weekend uh, away, came back to Sydney and went back to work as usual and <clears throat> sitting at my computer I noticed that I felt like everything was just like I was still on that boat and I almost fell on the floor and had to call in some colleagues to my office and so for about three weeks I was bedridden um, and I was told that I had a really bad ear infection and given medication for that. So once that had subsided, um, so three, we three weeks bedridden, I uh, realised that I was still moving. And it seemed to get worse after eating certain foods, so I thought that I'd developed some sort of food intolerance and that was the issue. So basically I'd seen numerous doctors and they continued to tell me that I had depression and anxiety and, you know, I was prescribed antidepressants and, and things like that. Uh, I was, I mentioned about the food issues that I was having and I was diagnosed with something called postprandial hypertension. When you eat, all the blood goes to your gut and moves away from your brain. So therefore, that's why they thought I was feeling dizzy. Um, so, as I said, had lots of tests and no real answers and it was very frustrating and I started to believe that maybe there was something psychologic, psychologically wrong with me. Um, until I uh, was diagnosed at, at the end of 2015 after meeting with a vestibular physiotherapist and she said, you know, you don't have standard vestibular issues, there's something uh, more central, so something to do with my brain. She was the one who actually uh, suggested that I go and see uh, Sean Watson at Randwick, who's also at Blacktown, um, up in Sydney. And so it took a couple of months to see him, but when I finally did, within the first five minutes, he told me what I had, which was really, really uh, great. Um, you know, it's a bit emotional for me, but um, it was good to put a name to it. And uh, w along with that joy came the sadness of you know, seeing other people's experiences with it and that they hadn't found any relief. So it was a happy time, but also quite a distressing time. Um, so now knowing that I had MDDS, uh, my husband actually did a lot of online research for me because I was just, you know, I, I didn't know where to start. Um, so he actually found uh, MDDS Australia, uh, the Facebook group, and that's how I got in there. And also he found uh, Dr. Dye's treatment in uh, New York. So we contacted Dr. Dye and he said, listen, I don't want to treat you because if you fly over or you know, get the treatment and fly back, you are going to get it again on your, on your way back. So I basically begged and said, you know, I'm, at the time I got it, I was 28. And I said, I haven't really lived my life, so just let me do this. I'm willing to pay you the money and I will, I'll come over. Um, and so he agreed, but under one condition that I had to stay in the States for about six weeks afterwards because he didn't want me to fly immediately after the treatment, which was, which was fine. Um, so I went and saw Dr. Dye. If you'd like to see a video of the treatment, uh, of my, no? Oh, the phone is dead. Don't worry about it. But the treatment is not dead. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I did the treatment uh, in f uh, over a week and then had follow-up visits to Dr. Dye over the next couple of weeks. And the treatment was uh, incredible. Um, you know, it, uh, Dr. Chen said that there was a, a 40 to 50 uh, success rate. It's actually a little bit higher than that. It's 70. And um, 
the, the most amazing thing about it is, you know, you, you get the optokinetic uh, stimulus, which are these white and black bars that move past you. They were so powerful that they could just induce uh, a headache in just a couple of seconds of looking at it or induce intense head pressure. And then if the, if the lines went the other way, it could completely reverse it. So it's, it's really strange that a visual stimulus can do that. Anyway, so it reduced my symptoms uh, by half. So when I went there, was, I was about a five or six on a scale of 10, and I left there about a two or three. And then over time, my symptoms have gone down to about a one or two, uh, and they do get a little bit higher um, around at different times of the month, which is where I've actually um, where I've started looking into kind of the hormonal aspects of, of this condition, because it seems very evident in myself that I, my symptoms are changing around those particular hormone fluctuation times. And yeah, so I started uh, a research, MDDS research group um, earlier this year. So I don't actually have much, many results to take you through today, but I can talk about what I've done and, and just some preliminary, preliminary results that I do have. Um, <coughs> but uh, yeah, so I've, my previous research has been in, in hearing and looking at restoring hearing for deaf people. Uh, so I have a neuroscience background, so it just seemed kind of perfect uh, in a way uh, that I was kind of primed to do this research. And I'm obviously very passionate about it because I need to find some answers for myself. Um, so the research studies that we've been doing over the past year um, is we firstly started off with just a questionnaire. And thank you for those who took part in that. Uh, so we had 265 respondents, uh, which is just fantastic given that it's such a rare condition. And basically what we wanted to um, look at was what is the, uh, oh sorry, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we what we wanted to look at was basic clinical data. Just how old are you, what, you know, what is your menopausal status, anything like that. Just we want to know everything about you so we can put this all together to pull out, is there, are there any similarities between these people? Um, we also did a, a, a spontaneous questionnaire and we got 104 respondents, which is again amazing given that spontaneous patients are you know, the minority within this minority group. Mm -hmm. So as I said, we were looking at basic clinical data, uh, asking questions about treatments that have helped these people, you know, physiotherapy, what, what works best for people looking at uh, hormones, uh, were the people, when, when they were on the boat, were they going through menopause, were they in per at perimenopausal um, transition? All of these different types of questions. Were you, did you have your period when you're on the boat? Um, we looked at triggers as well to see what the most common triggers were um, and looked at how symptoms have changed over time for those people who've had symptoms for, you know, 20 years. Um, so, the data of this, since there is, there's thousands, there's so much data to process, which is great, but uh, completely overwhelming. Um, but what we have seen um, is that there is just a clear hormonal component with this condition. Given that there are more females, so 90% females, it's 10% males. I mean, really, what's the difference between us? Um, you know, females do look better, but that can't just be the only <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, he agrees. Good. Every smarter. Yeah. <laughs> Bigger brains, you know, more things can go wrong. Um, so, you know, the main difference is, is the type of hormones that we have running through our bodies. I mean, males, yes, do get, have estrogen because estrogen is important for bone formation. However, you know, predominantly the, the females have more estrogen, more pr progesterone and are more, um, susceptible to the, the fluctuations because, you know, through the menstrual cycle, hormones go up, hormones go down, hormones go up. And then through menopause as well, these hormones go, they're all over the place, up, down, yes, they crash and then they peak. And it actually leaves women more susceptible to the fluctuations of these hormones. Um, so the data of this will be, you know, uh, processed at least by the end of the year. So, you know, you can have a nice read of that and, and it'll, uh, you know, have, uh, information about the different treatments that are, are working for people and what seems to be working for m the majority of people with MDDS is antidepressants, but they don't know why. 
So that's another thing that we're trying to look at and why antidepressants are helping because we want to know the mechanism. Um, so another research study that we are doing now, we are looking at those who are pregnant with MDDS. So, so far we have um, 44 people that have responded, so we're still recruiting for this. So if you know any people that have been pregnant while having MDDS, um, that would, you know, please refer them. Um, so we did this um, because obviously the, the hormonal component, as, as a female is pregnant, there is changes in, in they don't obviously have the fluctuations of estrogen and, and progesterone. Uh, it's more a sustained uh, increase as you get to the, you know, the third trimester. Um, so what we have seen so far is that it is rare for MDDS to start during pregnancy, and I think this is due to the fact that there are no large hormonal fluctuations during pregnancy, uh, given that when I'm talking about estrogen and, and progesterone, um, and that symptoms appear to be reduced during pregnancy. So could it be that since we have this sustained level of hormones without these peaks and troughs, that that's why their symptoms aren't, you know, not fluctuating because their hormones aren't fluctuating. So we will be uh, analysing that uh, in the next couple of months when you know, we've got to close it first. So we're still recruiting for that one, as I just mentioned. Um, then we are, so currently we're also doing a longitudinal diary, which some of you in here are part of, which is great. Thank you very much. Um, but basically uh, what we want to do is uh, see if we can link hormonal symptoms with uh, MDDS symptoms, <coughs> such as you know, changes in vaginal mucus, uh, breast tenderness, anything like that. We want to see if there are uh, you know, clear links between ovulation, which is day 14, 15 of the menstrual cycle, to see uh, is there a peak of symptoms around that time? Is there a peak of symptoms around menstruation when there is another uh, big hormonal change? And to be honest, uh, I actually put this study together because I noticed that a couple of days before my ovulation, I know when I'm ovulating because I'm like this. And I know when I'm about to get my period because I'm also like that. So, you know, I looked into that. What is happening at ovulation? What is happening before menstruation? At ovulation, we have an increase of estrogen and then we have a sharp decrease. So that's the first thing that's interesting. Then at menstruation, there is again another increase of estrogen and then a sharp decrease. And it seems that the, the common denominator is this sharp decrease in estrogen. And this <coughs> happens a lot. You have sharp peaks and decreases in estrogen <coughs> in menopause. So once menopause has passed, the hormones don't leave you alone. They actually still will increase and decrease and cause havoc. And especially in pre, uh, perimenopausal uh, state, which is the time around menopause. And that can actually start eight years before menopause actually happens. So there's this could be a period of eight years where your hormones are all over the place, leaving you more susceptible to getting MDDS. And another interesting thing is, you know, a lot of uh, people that get it are in uh, of older, you know, um, you know, between 40 and, and 60. So that captures the people in that perimenopausal, that transition where hormones are all over the place. And it's also the time when people are starting to retire and going on cruises, whereas younger people are not. They're, you know, backpacking across Thailand or something like that. You actually, it's, you're, it's, you know, hormones are all over the place. You're having extra time that you're wanting to spend with your family. It's like recipe for disaster, really. Um, okay, sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. Uh, what else we wanted to look at um, in this longitudinal uh, diary is to correlate the symptoms that patients are experiencing and correlating them with daily experiences. So, did you get a bad sleep last night? Are you stressed? Did you go to the shopping centre? So, we want to see, oh, is it raining? These are the questions in, 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 the, in the diary. Can we say, all right, well, it started to rain, it, you know, wherever you were, if you were in Adelaide or whatever, um, because it's shown that uh, changes in barometric pressure, which happen when it rains, has a significant effect on vestibular symptoms. And that's across many years. Uh, um, 
and other vestibular, like vestibular migraine. So it's, it's not, it's not uh, random and, and it's not crazy that you do feel bad when it is overcast or when it's raining. It's very, it's very real. Um, so we just wanted to correlate that and say, well, look, MDDS patients are feeling worse when it's raining and this is due to barometric um, changes. Um, okay. Uh, and again, we're still recruiting for this, so if you would like to take part, please email me. There, are, there is some selection criteria, but, you know, we can have a chat about those. Um, lastly, um, the study that we are, um, which is a little bit more, uh, you know, invasive, um, is a, we're looking at the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and what the sympathetic nervous system is, so in our bodies we have the somatic nervous system, and so that's dealing with your nerves that you can control, so me touching this or moving around. And then we also have the autonomic nervous system, which is responsible for our automatic reflexes, you know, or anything that's automatic in our body, our heart rate, breathing rate, uh, digestion, um, anything that we don't have to think about. So that's the autonomic nervous system. So within the autonomic nervous system, we have two different arms. We have the parasympathetic, which is responsible for our rest and digest responses. So digestion, sleeping, your body regenerating, and, and you know, it's, it's low stress. And then you have the sympathetic system. And the sympathetic is your stress response. And so your sympathetic nervous system is responsible for increasing your heart rate, decreasing digestion, constricting your blood vessels to make sure blood returns to your heart faster, increasing breathing rate. So it's common you know, stress responses. So if you think you start shaking, if you're stressed, your heart rate goes up. And, <laughs> and so that's your sympathetic nervous system. So we actually wanted to look, is, are there differences in the sympathetic nervous systems of those with MDDS compared to those without MDDS? Because when we are exposed to triggers, whether it's, you know, bright fl flashing lights or a lot of noise, what happens to me and a lot of people who have MDDS is that it's a very stressing and what happens is we, you know, our sympathetic nervous system is activated and we start feeling bad. And that's actually what perpetuates your symptoms and flares them up because we know that stress is a major trigger for getting your symptoms higher. So is it that people with MDDS have a hyperactive sympathetic nervous system? So has something triggered within our brains that has made us hyper, you know, aware and just a little bit jittery, oh, that's too loud, oh, that's too bright, there's too much going on, and then that could turn into a panic attack or anything like that. And so then that's why the doctors might say, oh, you've got anxiety or, you know, stress disorder. Well, that could be, but is it because my nervous system has changed? So we wanted to look at that. So what we're basically doing is we are recording sympathetic uh, nerve activity from a nerve at the knee. And so you might say, well, why the knee? But you can actually record the overall sympathetic nerve activity from any nerve in the body. So basically, it just sends messages out to the whole body. So you can, you can see what the brain is doing, even recording from a nerve um, at the knee. So what we've done is we've uh, recorded the baseline sympathetic nerve activity of our patients and then we've exposed them to non-stressful stimuli. So the first non-stressful stimuli is holding um, a handheld massager. And it, so it's just got <coughs> vibration because vibration, you may not know, uh, or you may know, is a, is a big trigger. So if you're on an elevator or if you're in a shopping center and the ground is moving, it's a very confusing message for your body. I, am I moving? Um, I don't think I'm moving. And then you're uh, trying to hold on to something. Um, so we've done the, so for, so sorry, so someone who doesn't have MDDS can hold a handheld massager and it's not going to cause any issues, but for MDDS people, it might be perceived as stressful if your sympathetic nervous system is hyperactive and you're already kind of thinking that, well not thinking, it's unconscious, your body is thinking that something bad is happening, therefore you start to stress out. So that was the first non-stressful stimulus. And then the, non the second non-stressful stimulus was looking, uh, watching a video. And what the video is, is the night sky, which has stars in it, and then the ground, uh, which is some mountains. And basically what we have is the, the, uh, the stars are moving over the mountains, but the camera is also moving as well. So basically what you have is stars moving in one direction and the ground moving in another direction. So again, a very challenging 
stimulus to watch for those with MDDS, but those without, like, oh, that's a nice video, but for those with MDDS, that's very confusing and it all, it all almost uh, invokes the perception of movement in these people. We're recording the sympathetic nerve activity to see if their sympathetic nervous system is overactive. Are, are we seeing a huge response when they start to watch the video? Are, they, are we seeing a huge response when they're holding the massager? So we are still doing these experiments, so I don't have much to tell you about that yet, but what we have seen is that the people with MDDS don't like to watch the video and some have asked us to turn it off before it has ended, whereas the control subjects just sit there and they're like, am I supposed to be feeling anything? And I'm like, nope, just that's fine to sit there. And so it's very obvious that people with MDDS um, are becoming, well, a, a population of those with MDDS are actually becoming more visually dependent. So meaning that they're using their visual sense to actually obtain balance because the vestibular organ, so what is in our, in our head, so the vestibular apparatus, that is not doing its job and our body knows that. So for our whole vestibular system to work, we rely on our sight, we rely on our proprioception, which is our body in space, but then also the position of our head. So we know already that there is a disconnect between those, those systems or those different senses. So the brain tries to change and compensate. So if the vestibular apparatus isn't working the way that it should, it gives more weighting to something else it thinks it can re rely on, and that is the eyes. So that's why, uh, you know, if you, are, um, you have MDDS, some people, if there are busy patterns or having the cars going in your peripheral vision, that can make you feel, oh, I'm moving. And that's because your brain is getting your balance through your visual system. Um, so, so far we've done um, 11 controls and we've done six MDDS patients. So I'm hoping for about four more MDDS uh, patients. Um, so we've looked at sympathetic responses to non-stressful stimuli, uh, stimuli and so we're basically looking for uh, sympathetic hyper, so it's overactive or hypoactivity if it's lower. But I'm leaning more towards that it is hyper given uh, the way that the patients are responding, that it's a, quite a stressful thing that they're experiencing. Um, and still recruiting for that, as I mentioned. I don't think I want to say anything more about that. Um, so moving on now to uh, one of the, the main theory that I have um, about MDDS. And I think that hormonal influences, is, it seems very clear um, but obviously we still need to do lots of research into, into proving that. So the reason why I've come to this particular uh, theory is that MDDS patients predominantly are female and so it's a nine to one uh, ratio. Um, there's a high percentage of post-menopausal women uh, uh, that are, um, have MDDS. Um, high percentage of them also, um, their onset was close to menopausal transition. So as I said, that can be eight years before menopause, which is a long time. Um, but then, so there's people like me, so I haven't been through menopause and there's, uh, you know, uh, if you split it um, based on our motion, um, ooh, vibrations, don't like it. Um, <laughs> um, so if we split up the motion, uh, the people who filled, who filled in the motion survey, so about uh, 55 or 60 percent were postmenopausal, and then the rest were um, naturally cycling women. And so, what we found in those women, the naturally cycling, is that they have symptom hikes around ovulation and around uh, menstruation. So again, that further supports my theory that it's these hormonal fluctuations. Um, and so, those with menopause have gone through menopause. Again, it's hard to track. Uh, whether, you know, it, it's hormonal, be, that's because the hormones of a menopausal woman, they're all different and different women can have high estrogen, some women can have high progesterone. So it's, if hormonal uh, influences are playing a role in this, we're going to need to find a very targeted approach to women and it's not going to be uh, one pill fixes all, but uh, it's going to have to be a tailored uh, treatment protocol per individual. 
Um, so back to the, the naturally cycling women, what we found as well is that uh, a low percentage of those naturally cycling women, uh, a low percentage were on hormonal contraception. And why that's important is because when a woman takes uh, the oral contraceptive pill or any type of hormonal contraception, they actually just get a, a dose of estrogen or progesterone or mixed and it doesn't fluctuate. So they're actually not susceptible to those peaks and troughs unless they take the one week off. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the pill. With the pill, you take three weeks or yeah, three weeks of the actual hormone and then one week is a, a placebo pill, so it's just a sugar pill. So there's only one opportunity for, or one time in that, in that whole cycle for there to be a decrease in the hormones. So that reduces the likelihood of that by half because you're having naturally cycling women having two times a month where they have the, the drops in estrogen, whereas in, in those on hormonal contraception, only having one drop of, uh, of hormone. So this could suggest that in younger people, using hormonal contraception actually is a protective uh, agent, which is interesting. So, um, so that's something that could be uh, looked into. Um, so moving on to future projects. Oh, that one came up first. That's all right. So I'll start with the first one. So we've got, uh, we're looking into doing an animal study, um, looking at uh, estrogen and progesterone receptors um, in naturally cycling mice. Um, and we're actually going to look at the areas of the brain that um, Alan was talking about that uh, Dr. Cha over in the States found that there was uh, hyperactivity in. So we want to see if in naturally cycling mice, do these areas express more receptors for these particular hormones? And if they do, that could suggest why uh, these areas become hyperactive um, during, uh, hyperactive during, uh, you know, changes in, in hormonal fluctuations, which could actually change the function of them. And what you could, um, and what that could do if we have more receptors being expressed in brain regions that have been linked to MDDS, could there be a, a link there? So uh, that's something that we're hoping to do uh, next year if we get uh, the funding. Um, also looking at uh, blood and or saliva testing uh, to check hormonal profiles of um, you know, male and females to see what their hormonal profile is and, and could that you know, uh, you know, link to why these particular women or, and males have MDDS. Do all people who have MDDS have lower estrogen levels or do they have um, extremely high estrogen levels, which means that potentially they could crash every now and again, which could make someone feel, you know, have symptoms more frequently, uh, things like that. Um, and so, you know, if we can establish um, the hormonal <coughs> aspects in these women and men, could this lead to uh, the development of hormonal therapies? Um, hormonal therapies might not be able to get rid of the condition, uh, someone with, you know, someone with MTS, but it could significantly reduce the amount of uh, sy sy uh, symptom fluctuations that they have throughout the month. So could we give someone a, a one-off, uh, a dose of hormones that is, you know, what's the word I'm trying to say? Sustained, yeah, something like that. Sustained, so you don't have those fluctuations. So that, you know, that would be in the future, but we have to establish, you know, what uh, the hormones are doing in, in different uh, patients. Um, and then lastly, uh, trialling another optokinetic uh, treatment. Um, so there is an optokinetic treatment that has been developed over in Belgium that uh, helps people with visually induced dizziness. And as I was mentioning before, uh, a lot of people with MDDS start relying on their uh, using their eyes and their vision to actually get their ba balance. And so um, the upside, I mean the downside of that is that when there's something too busy going on, busy pattern or bright lights, they get something called visually induced dizziness or something where their symptoms can be hiked by seeing something visually uh, complicated. So there is a treatment where it's basically a desensitisation um, 
for visually induced dizziness. Uh, so for those who have MDDS who are visually dependent might be able to do a treatment like this that could actually reduce uh, their visually induced dizziness and that might be able to uh, help with their symptoms. Um, and that's all I wanted to talk about today. So if you have any questions. Do you have the same symptoms on a plane and a boat or is a boat worse or a plane worse for you? So what you mean, do I experience sy symptoms on a plane? Is that what no, well after you've, after you've been, what, what, what your symptoms for your MDS is either is it, uh, after a flying oh. or, or on, on a boat? Okay, so I don't, I haven't been on a boat since, no, but I have yeah. been on a plane. And so after I get off the plane, what I f feel is bobbing, that I'm walking on pillows, but then that subsides within 30 minutes. But how I get around the flying is that I take um, a vestibular depressant, which is uh, travel calm. So it's also an antihistamine. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah so that, that's really helpful. And that just, travel calm. Travel calm. Yeah, over the counter. Yeah, travel calm. No, yeah, they're a waste of time. Yeah, <laughs> they are an absolute waste of time. That's what I took on the first boat, and I wish I didn't. That's, um, I think, maybe what he was trying to say. <coughs> I do am quite the time ago. Is there yep. a different MDDS that you might get if oh. you travelled on a plane to what you would do on a boat? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, no, I, I think so it much, it's all the it's same. All the same. Boat, yeah, boat. yeah. So the symptoms seem to be the same. Oh, okay, mm. right. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's right, and and also on a plane you don't actually have the visual um, stimulus. So I don't, I don't understand why there is a difference, but um, it's basically what has happened in our brains is that our brains have recalibrated for the plane or the boat that we've been on, so we don't feel sick. But then when we've come off, then it hasn't gone back to land. So we're still in this, we're adapted to a plane or a boat, and, but we're on land. And it's a normal uh, bodily response. Our brains do that, um, so we're not sick on the boat. And what happens when you are seasick is that your proprioceptors are feeling, because you're moving like this, so your legs and your arms are feeling that you're moving on a boat, and then you're actually seeing the uh, horizon or whatever going like this, and then your vestibular system is feeling that your head is moving like this. So your brain actually thinks that you have ta eaten something poisonous or something dangerous that you're hallucinating, and so that's why you vomit. So <laughs> that's why you vomit, um, that's why you're sick. Um, so that's what our brain does. It, it calibrates to this new environment on the boat, but then we obviously haven't come back from that. Mm -hmm. How high are your symptoms when you're overweight and whatever else? Um, well, I can speak from experience today. Um, <laughs> 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 um, so I'm probably about a two, I don't know, two to three. Yeah. But that's it. it's okay. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that video that you made. Mm -hmm. Yep. But it was so simple and it made a lot of my friends understand exactly what it is. I Great. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh oh because you're not on Facebook, is it's that it's on the community page? Yeah, it's on the community page. Yeah. So it's just a short little video we made. Any other questions? Um, so it was two and a half thousand US. So for the, for the treatment, yes. Um, I thought it was worth it. Yeah. It's five days the treatment, but uh, he said to stay for longer. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.